I'm going to ask you to meet me in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20, as we take a look at the Great Commission, which has become our foundation for this entire series. And Yeshua came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This morning I welcome you to Discipleship 101, Season 4, Episode 7. That means that we are 47 messages into this series. We are digging deep understand what it means to be a disciple of Christ and to live like one. Well, we've looked at the Great Commission. Perhaps it's a good time for us to take a look at the Great Commandment. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 35. And the scripture reads, Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him and saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Yeshua said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. For this is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Today's message, Discipleship 101, Season 4, Episode 7, Cultivating a Heart for God. Cultivating a Heart for God. You note, we note, in the Great Commandment, in verse 37, Yeshua said to him, You shall love the Lord your God, and he, God, he starts out saying, With all your heart. Before you get to loving him with all your soul, I've told you that God's got to go through your heart before he can mend your fractured soul. Before you get to loving him with all your soul, even with all your mind, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. I have presented to you before what we call the ministry wheel. And the question I have today is, how does one go from ignorant or misinformed or a position of unbelief or doubt to the place of sharing Christ, witnessing for the Lord, helping others walk in the kingdom as a fully developed POC for God, which is what it means to be one of his ministers. Minister is not a title. Minister's got nothing to do with reverend. Min we are all supposed to grow up to the point where we can minister, administer the gospel to the sick. Like medicine, we administer the prescription so that they can be healed by the great physician. And we are all to be field doctors. Paramedics running across the battlefield with our little red cross on the back. They won't shoot at us because NATO said they can't. And we go up and we patch the guy up and we get him on a helicopter and we triage him out. And next thing you know, we see him back at the medical hospital. He says, hey, you're the guy who pulled me out. It's no big deal. It's just what I do for the, for the commander. Because I live as... But the question is, how do you get there? And the answer is, it's a heart thing. It's a hard thing. I stand before you today, and I remind you from time to time, that I stand before you today as one who was once ignorant, once misinformed, and once a very vocal atheist. I was not a confused guy. I hadn't lost my way. I did not believe that God existed. I had already tried the Buddhist thing. It didn't work out. I was in a room chanting Omnio Renge Kyo. 
and nothing, nobody showed up. I just got tired of being in that room. I said, I forget about this. Ain't no God. The only reason I tried that because the guy I met was really convinced that Buddhism was the way to God. And I was like, nah, you're making it up. How do I then go from that person to the person today who is now your pastor and spiritual leader? I'm obviously thoroughly convinced that God is. I'm a resource in your life that you would turn to and feel confident. You'll, you'll probably know. <laughs> How do I go from being that to being who I am today? The answer is, it's a heart thing. How does Paul go from a confused Jew who is a Christian killer to being the guy who writes two-thirds of the New Testament it's a hard thing. So we it, it's really critical that we deal with this issue of the heart. Now, in order for us to deal with the issue of the heart, we've got to be able to process what God says about the heart. He says that there are only two conditions of the heart. There's the heart that goats have. And there's the heart that the sheep have. Wave at me if you've heard that before. Heard about the goats? Okay. It's not a derogatory term. He's just pointing out that there are goats and there are sheep. The goats are the ones whose heart is void of God. The sheep are the ones whose heart contains the presence of God. And we have to be really clear about what a goat is, what a goat looks like. Like, we need to know when we were goats and recognize them when we see them. Some people don't believe they were ever goats. Some people believe they grew up as sheep. They believe they were sheep all their life that they would never go, and we need to deal with that. Because some, some, think, some think that they're goats, and they're sheep, and then there's a third category we call those possums. You know, possums are notorious for faking it. Um, when I was in high school, not high school, college, uh, a little while in my early years when I was in college, I ran up on a possum down there in North Carolina. I didn't know what it was. Came around the side of a gas station, looked like a very large New York City rat. I thought it was my duty to save the community from this huge rat, so I decided I was going to fight the possum. So I grabbed something from the gas station, one of the water, water coils, and I went up to the possum, and the possum leaned back, and the possum was like, <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's on. And I fought the possum. Like I said, I was wild in my young years. I prevailed <laughs> and then took the possum back to school, back to college, and showed everybody. All the girls were looking out the girls' dorm. I was holding up this possum. I thought it was a big rat. They were like, oh, my God, John killed a rat. John killed a rat. <laughs> she still married me. <laughs> Because she was there. She saw that thing. Anyway, possums are known for when they in a jam, they'll roll over and put their feet up and play like they're dead. And so that's become known as playing possum. And some of us think that there are possums, those who are not quite sheep, but they're not quite goats. They're kind of in between. So let me try to help all of us come to a place Biblical understanding of where we all are. The first grouping would be the goats. These are unsaved people. Unsaved people can be in one of four categories. Either unsaved people are just unaware of God. If you've never met anybody who has no God consciousness, I am telling you there are people out there in our community who don't know anything about God. 
I've met people who, I met a lady who was about 50 years old, the first time she'd ever been to church in her life, she was about 50 years old. She didn't know anything about God. So for those of us who grew up being exposed to the things of God, we think that's unusual, but there are people who are just unaware. They are ghosts. Some people are aware of what the Bible teaches about Christ and what the church believes. And so they're aware of some things, but they don't believe. They're unbelieving. They are goats too. There are some people who are believing, meaning they believe what they've heard. They believe that Jesus is the Christ. They believe that. But they are unchurched, undiscipled. They are un, they're disconnected from the body of Christ. Those people are goats too. I'm, ta- I'm not talking about saved people. I'm talking about people who believe the stories that they've heard. They have given mental assent to it, but they are not really walking in the way of the Lord. They are goats. And the last place where you're going to find goats are in church. Some people are believing, and they are unsaved, and they are unsaved church goats. You know how they're goats and yet believing? Because believing doesn't save us. We're not saved by what we believe, because that would mean that we save ourselves. That would be all I have to do is believe it. And if I believe it, I'm a Christian because I believe it. But your believing doesn't save you. Only the Spirit of Christ. You must be born again, he told Nicodemus. Nicodemus already believed the Christ when he met him in the garden. He wouldn't have come there seeking truth if he was like the other Pharisees. He never would have snuck off. And the scripture says in many places, many of the Jews believed him, but for fear of retribution, they stayed with the crowd. He was one of the Jews who believed him, but he was not a saved man. Because he told him, you must be born again. Your beliefs don't save you. The spirit of God has to give birth to you. Amen? If we are not careful with that, what we'll think is we'll think that when we were, I've I've been going to church pretty much all my life. I've been going to church all, literally all my life. They took me in when I was a baby. I was christened. Then I started going to Sunday school. Then I got into the youth group. And then I was, you know, one of the leaders, youth leaders in the church. I was very active in my church growing up. If you were to meet the pastor that pastored me when I was a little boy growing up, he would tell you, of course John Thompson is a Christian. His whole family is Christian. He's been Christian all his life. I'm sorry, Reverend, that doesn't line up with the word of God. John Thompson had not been born again, and you cannot train people to be Christian, they must be born again. Amen? This is not me. This is scripture. And going to John chapter 3, he's going to tell you that it's so. So then, what are what are the sheep? Three categories of sheep. There are those who are undisciplined. These are actually saved saved people who are either unchurched or churched, but they are undiscipled. You can find them outside the church, in the community, and they are saved. They carry the Spirit of Christ, but they've not been discipled, and therefore they're not churched. Anyone that you meet as a person who is carrying Christ that is disconnected from the church has not been discipled. Because a disciple would understand that God works in our lives through his church, not in spite of it. So you cannot have 
a personal relationship with Jesus and not be connected to his bride. You can't say, I love pastor, but I can't stand Sister Andrea. You can't hang out with me disrespecting my wife. And the church is his bride, and you saying you want to get close to me, and you talking about my woman? There's not a decent, self-respecting man that's going to want to hang with you when you talk about his woman. Can I preach it? Y'all praised him right. So you got people who are saved but are undiscipled, and they're therefore disconnected from his church because if they had been taught the way of the Lord, they would understand that God's work in their life is going to be perfected through the church. Or they are church, but they're in a church where they don't understand the importance of a role of discipleship, and therefore they're not disciple, but it's not their fault. They're just a part of the system that's not discipling them. The second believer, the second person, and when I say believer, I don't mean one who believes. Now, I've said that before. I just want to make sure because sometimes you think that a believer is one who believes. A believer, a born-again person, a Christian, a son or daughter of God, they are all interchangeable terms. But those one believing, Cornelius was believing, but he was unsaved. Believing speaks to your disposition. Being a believer speaks to you receiving the gift of salvation. Can I get an amen? amen. Y'all push me now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they are discipled. Then there are some who are believers, who are saved, who are discipled and churched. And I would hope that we have many of those here. And there are those who are discipled and witnessing or discipling others. Those are your three categories of sheep, and we are trying to produce sheep number three. So to answer the question, how then do people in those different categories move around this wheel from ignorant, misinformed, atheist, doubter to the point that they become a seeker, believer, disciple, and then minister of the gospel of Christ. It's a heart thing. Would you please say that with me? Say it's a heart thing. It's a, it, it's a, it's a heart thing. So I got a question for you. How do we become the people God has called us to be and help others to come to the place where they honor and serve God with wholehearted devotion. And the answer is, when God has captured our hearts, this becomes the new normal. Anybody who is not living as the person that God has called them to be and actively involved in helping others come to the place where they honor and serve God with wholehearted devotion is a child of God whose heart has not been captured by the Lord. It's like God, when I was a kid, we used to go down to my grandmother's house. My grandmother, uh, she raised chickens. And when they wanted to have chicken for whatever, you had to go out there and catch a chicken. I didn't because I was a child, so I didn't have to do that. But one of my fathers or uncles or somebody would go out there and catch a chicken, and it was something to watch. We'd go out there and stand and watch to see how long it was going to take him to catch his chicken. Some of us, God is after our hearts, and we are like the chicken. <laughs> we run, you're <laughs> trying to get that chicken. He said, come on, I'm trying to catch your heart. I, uh, you're going to have my heart. I'm hanging on to my heart. I serve you from a distance. See, until I catch that chicken, I can't determine what that chicken's going to become. That chicken may become broiled chicken. He may become chicken fricassee. He may become some, some uh, chicken Alfredo. He may become some chicken coat on blue. I don't know what he's going to become, but I got to catch him. I got to catch him. And that chicken's like, I don't want to be none of that. I want to be my own boss. I want to run in the yard and be free. I'm an American chicken. I'm a democratic chicken. 
I live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. You better get yourself in that pot. You better get yourself in that pot, you demon chicken. Don't you know I'm your owner? I raised you for my own satisfaction. I raised you for my glory. And now you dare not get in my pot. Have you forgotten where you came from? Have you forgotten the hand that just feed you? You sit around eating my corn. Have you forgotten that it's me that comes out there? Yeah. Have you forgotten that it's me? And now I got you fat and happy. And you talk about you want to express yourself. I have a, I want to give room for my inner chicken. So you can only do this when God has captured your heart and this becomes the new normal. Good news is you can cultivate a heart for God. You can cultivate a heart for God. If you're that chicken, there's no shame. I'm laughing, but there's no shame because you can do something about that heart. So instead of running from your creator, you run to your creator. And that's what we talk about today. So the rest of this time, I want to talk to you about cultivating a heart for God. I want to give you 12 things that you can do, 12 elements, really, of cultivating a heart for God. I'll tell you this. Very often, I'll, I'll come up, I've got a message, and I've got three things, or five things, or seven things, or 12 things. Very often in those delineations. Twelve is the number of authority, by the way. Twelve apostles, twelve uh, sons of Ishmael. The, the twelve is the number of authority. It's the number of government. And so um, when we talk about twelve, when God gave me twelve, and I want you to know that I didn't just sit down and say, I got to come up with twelve things. I went through scripture looking for what God reveals in scripture about the heart and the heart being cultivated and converted and so forth. And I gathered all my notes, and then I wrote them up on my whiteboard, and then I started numbering them in order, sequential order. And one was up here, and four was down here, and seven was here. And when I finished the numbering, there were 12. So this is not contrived by man. See, this is just coming out of the scripture, this is what God had for us. And I need you to know that because sometimes you think I'm just packaging stuff and I am not. I'm just delivering the mail. So let's take a look at what God gave those who are here. The first thing we want to understand is that in cultivating a heart is that we all start with a fallen heart. It's very important for us to know that. We all start here. And here's the thing. For any of us to think that we didn't start with a fallen heart is for us to have absolute arrogance to suggest that we didn't start with a fallen heart. Look here with me at Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And I have my amplification in there. And the scripture reads, the fallen, unregenerated, unconverted. Why do I say that? Because Jeremiah is writing prior to Pentecost. He's writing prior to Christ's gift of salvation. So the human heart cannot be changed in the Old Testament because God is changing the heart through the agency of Christ. So when he talks about the condition of the heart of the Old Testament man, it has to be the fallen, unregenerated, unconverted heart. This statement, this passage, should not be true of the born-again believer's heart. Because it's out of your heart that come blessings. And it's 
out of a good heart that a good man brings forth good. See, your heart is supposed to be a different heart, but the old fallen heart, that heart, he describes, it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Sometimes we teach that that's the heart we have today, but that should not be the heart you have today. You go in for heart surgery, you come out, they tell you that your heart's still not working, you got to call your doctor and your lawyer. Greenberg and Betterman, you better call somebody. Better get them on it. Why? Because they gypped you. So now Christ has done surgery, and you come out with the same heart you had prior? No. And that's the thing. We have to know that we all started with a fallen heart. Well, I, don't have, I didn't have a fallen heart. My mom and daddy taught me, you know, all the things early. You had a fallen heart. If you don't have a fallen heart, what you do is you rob God of his glory. You rob God of his glory, and you rob God of his glory by taking away your B.C. and your A.D. Everybody should have, everybody, every Christian has an A.D. story. You will hardly ever hear me talk about the things I was taught as a child. Because, and I went to Sunday school, and I heard the lessons and all of that, so there's a lot of stuff I could talk about. But that's not when I learned to walk with Christ. I didn't learn to walk with Christ until Christ took my hand. And that didn't happen until I got saved. So if I'm still trying to live on what I got as a child, and I'm talking about A.D. or B.C. lessons when I should be talking about an A.D. reality, I'm robbing God of his glory. Because he says, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's what? So now, I'm going back and I'm talking about the life I had prior to becoming a new creation, and I'm mixing that in, and it all becomes, and I don't have a clear picture in my life of my life prior to Christ, my life when I met Christ, and my life since Christ, and that's my, why my witness is weak. My testimony is weak because all I can talk about is I've always been pretty good. That ain't got nothing to do with Christ. Talk to me about the influence of his spirit in your darkened soul. I didn't have a darkened soul because I grew up learning how to do right and wrong. You had the darkest soul of all because you were at the wrong tree. You thought your moral upbringing was you living Christ, but it cannot be. Otherwise, you have established a righteousness apart from him. Can you be righteous apart from Christ? If you can, then he, he's the biggest fool of all. Because he went to the cross and he didn't have to. <laughs> he went to the cross to save us. And some of us figured out how to save ourselves. All we had to do was keep the Ten Commandments and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And I'm going to go in on that righteousness. Paul says, if there's, if there's any other way that you could have got it in, he says, I am among all the biggest fools. I'm the most pitiable. I'm the one to be pitied because I, I put my weight on the sacrifice of Christ and you're telling me I could have gone in saying I'm the Orangio. <laughs> I asked you last week, who do you say Christ is? Is he an 
adjective to your already pretty decent life? Or is he the way and no man comes to the Father except by him? You got to decide who you say he is. This is just Bible. This is not John. This is just Bible. And the question is, what do I believe about what God has revealed about himself? Or am I going with what I was taught in the tradition of men and holding on to that instead of coming under the commandment of God? Let me know you're with me. If you have a fallen heart, by default, you have a hardened heart. This is the result. A hardened heart is the result of living from your mind. If you have a fallen heart, your heart is void of truth. Therefore, all you can live by is fact. Your mind processes fact. Your heart reveals truth. But if your heart is void of truth, all you have is your mind, which means all you live by is fact. So instead of revelation, which comes up from the heart, you live from information, which comes down from the head. And so you live by logic, you live by reason, but Proverbs 3 told us, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own head. The path to walking with God is that you got to get out of your own head. Scripture does not always make good fact, but it always makes good faith. And so if you're trying to walk with God, and you're walking with God in your logic and in your reasoning, you are leaning on your own understanding, and you're not going to come to a place where you trust the Lord if you have to process him through the limitations of your mind. So your heart is hard. And your heart is hard because it's void of God. Because when God comes into a heart, he breaks up the fallow ground. Look here with me at uh, Proverbs 28, 14. The scripture says, Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Just by me having a hardened heart, it affects the quality of my life. Because God isn't looking as man looks, God looks at the heart. And so if I present to God a hard heart, I have given him a stubborn heart, a rebellious heart, a resistant heart, a doubtful heart. A skeptical heart. And he's like, I'm, I'm revealing truth. When you hear truth and you put up a wall against it, that's evidence of a hardened heart. If it doesn't feel good, you're like, you bristle like, I don't know. That's a hardened heart. You ought to immediately start praying, Lord, fix my heart. Where it all starts. Number three, a converted heart. A converted heart is where cultivating a heart starts. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27, he says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, which is a responsive heart, an open heart, a teachable heart. And I will put my spirit, the plan has always been for the Holy Spirit to, en to enable and empower the believer, the Christ carrier, to live a life that honors God. If you 
were taught that you can live a life that would please God without you having his spirit in you, you were deceived. I will put my spirit within you and cause you. You see it? You can't even walk in my statutes if the spirit of God in you is not caught. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Who's living for God's glory? It's not me. It's the Christ in me. Christ in me. The only hope of glory. The scripture is clear. It's not about us. It is not about us. It's not about me getting myself together and giving God the best version of myself. It's about me stop running across that yard and let my owner catch me. So that he can capture my heart. Number four. Once your heart is converted. Now you got to keep it clean. Psalm 51 beginning in verse 7. Pray. Purge me with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Hyssop was the branch that they used to put the blood over the door when the death angel was passing over. He said, bring that hyssop out and put the blood on it once again and purge me with the hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness that the bones you have you have broken, that, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Anytime anything gets in your converted heart that threatens to contaminate it, I want you to run to God and say, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. I got a funky spirit in me. Something's a little off this morning. I got to get my spirit right. Got to get my spirit right. I, you converted it, and now I got to clean it. I got to keep it clean by praying and cooperating with you. Purge me with hyssop, Lord. I don't have the hyssop. You got it, but I got to take down my defenses and let you in. I have to acknowledge that something, smell, something don't smell right in my heart. You come in the kitchen, eh, I need to take the trash out. Something don't smell right in here. When you get in your heart, you know when stuff don't smell right. Ha! Ah, come on now. Don't make me preach hard this morning. You know when you got some unforgiveness. You know when you got some bitterness. You know when you got some jealousy. You know when you got some competition. You know when you got some dishonesty. You know when you got some slander. You know when something doesn't smell right. And that's when you need to ask the Lord, Lord, I'm not looking at him, I'm looking at me. I'm, I'm, I can complain about him, but it's not about him. It's about me. It's not my boss. It's me, Lord. What's in my heart? What did I bring up in this job this morning? What did I bring up in this shop? What did I take to the store? Why am I so impatient waiting for a coffee? Where have I got to go but heaven? Waiting for my latte. Convert your heart. And then clean your heart. And then you got to look. You got to keep going because you got to look at his response to the heart changer. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. And look how he responds. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. I'm going to pay it forward. Out of my gratitude, what shall I render unto the Lord for all he's done? I'm going to pay it forward. I'm going to teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Every soul turn is a monument. I'm saying thank you, Lord. 
for what you did in my heart. Has the Lord done something in your heart? He says, how do you show me? You share it. You share it. Number five, a protected heart. Once converted, kept clean, protected. Proverbs 4, beginning in verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it spring the issues of, of life. But the question is, how do you keep it? Well, we got to keep going. Verse 24, put away from you a deceitful mouth and put perverse lips far from you. You keep it clean by watching your mouth. Verse 25, let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look to the right before. You keep it clean by watching your eyes. Look at verse 26, ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. You keep it clean by watching your feet. Where are you going? Look at verse 27, do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. You keep it clean by guarding your ways. Your mouth, your eyes, your feet, your ways. Guard your heart. Keep your heart with all diligence. For out of it comes your whole life. That's where people are always talking about how God's not fair. That's what makes it fair. Your life is in your heart. For everybody. It's fair. Steve Jobs had an iPod in his heart. Don't be mad. Mark Zuckerberg had Facebook in his heart. Don't be mad. Jeff Bezos had Amazon in his heart. Don't be mad. The question is, what do you have in your heart? As of yesterday, I am 335 pages into the book, How to Love Your Wife. It's not in your heart. It's not in your heart. It's not in your heart. It's in my heart. And if that book doesn't get written, I can't blame anybody but me. Nobody else is there. Nobody else is there. When I'm writing 2,000 words a day, nobody else is there. But when you see me on TV talking about my books, don't be mad. Don't be mad. Because I wrote 20 of them. They were in my heart. The question is, what's in yours? Talk to you about a fallen heart, a hardened heart, a converted heart, a cleansed heart, a protected heart. I want to talk about a word-confronted heart. How do I maintain heart health? Keep it under the word. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The, the word of God is able to go through your heart and show you you. You want to keep your heart, you want to stay in heart health, Keep yourself under the word of God. He says, and there is no creature hidden from God's sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. We will stand before him and answer, listen, for what was in our heart. He said he put this treasure in earthen vessels. Where do you think he put it? In your heart. Y'all with me today? Yeah. Number seven. Got to talk about maintaining a pure heart. This is when it gets good. Maintaining a good heart. The, I gotta, we, we gonna, the next two that we're going to look at are about having right sight. Right sight. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. When your heart is pure, it will give you right sight. And it says, for they shall what? See God. See, you got to have right sight. If you are living your life as one who says you are connected to God and you can't see God's movement in your life, you need to check your heart because one who's got a pure heart will be able to discern the movement of God. 
right sight. Somebody say right sight. Seeing clearly, seeing God clearly. Seeing God clearly will bring you to the place, the point of number eight, the proper priority of your heart's treasure because you're seeing things clearly. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 19. Right sight. You start with clear and accurate view of who God is, and then it gives you a clear and accurate view of this world and your place in it. From that, you establish proper priorities. You get your worship right. Verse 19, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What are you after? Are you chasing this world and your place in it? If so, you don't have right sight. But if you got your heart right, you would have right sight. The last four I want to give you are four resultant blessings that come from cultivating a heart for God. First of all, what it does is a healthy, converted heart produces a believing heart. It produces a believing heart. It produces a, belie a heart that's capable of really believing God. Not with mental assent, but heart conviction, heart commitment, that you're all in. Romans 10, 8 through 10 speaks of such a heart, and this heart is so convinced that it brings you into a place of salvation. But it says, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It's got to land in your heart, that out of that heart you would confess with your mouth, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua and believe in your convinced, convicted heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You position yourself for the Spirit of God to move into your heart because you've opened your doors to him. He doesn't make you saved. You can't make yourself be saved, but you position yourself that he can come in and fill you with his spirit because your heart has got a big sign over it that says vacancy. What sign is on your heart? For with the heart, he says, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Number 10. The second of these four resultant blessings is a heart that is healthy. A culture, heart that's cultivated for God produces a heart that chases God. Here's your prayer. Lord, make me a man or woman after God's heart. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with what? With all your heart. See, uh, uh, cultivating a heart for God, one of the ways that you know it is that your heart chases after God. Psalm 119, beginning of verse 9, asks, How can a young man cleanse his way? The answer, by taking heed according to the word of God. But verse 10 explains, With my whole heart I have sought you, Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart, which transforms my heart that I might not sin against you. If you see it in the word, just wave at me this morning so I know that I'm not making it up. Number 11, the third of these resultant blessings is that having a heart where it's been cultivated unto the Lord is that it produces a steadfast, fearless heart. A heart cultivated unto God produces a steadfast, fearless heart. I've met so many believers who are just fearful, insecure, doubtful, worried, fearful. 
but you can walk and live with a fearless heart. He promises prophetically from Psalm 112, it says, he will not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. That becomes a reality when the Spirit of God moves in. And number 12. The fourth resultant blessing is the joy of a peace-filled heart. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Yeshua, he wants to bring you into the joy of a peace-filled heart. All because you have cultivated a heart for God. So this is the support that I wanted to present to you. We call this section, I just went through cultivating a heart for God. I want to show them to you one more time. I'll put up one through six for those of you who want to see them on one screen. One through six. A fallen heart, a hardened heart, a converted heart, a cleansed heart, a protected heart, a word-confronted heart, and then it comes over to, to 7 through 8 where we maintain a pure heart. We have proper priority of, through the heart's treasure, uh, cultivating a believing heart, seeking the Lord with our heart, walking in the blessing of a steadfast, fearless heart, and knowing the joy of peace-filled heart. There's no way around this. Matthew chapter 22. Verse 37, he says, if you're going to love the Lord, the expectation is that you would love the Lord with all your heart. There's nothing else that will do short of wholehearted commitment to the Lord. Here's the truth. God calls us to love him wholeheartedly. It is easy to say we love him, but he is looking for a demonstration of our love through a commitment of our lives. And the question I have for us as we move toward our close is introspectively, do I really love the Lord? Do I really love the Lord? Has the Lord really captured my heart? Do I really love the Lord? He asked Peter this same question in John chapter 21. Scripture says, so when they had eaten breakfast, Yeshua said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said again a second time, Simon, do you love me? He said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed, my, tend my sheep. Then he said a third time, Simon, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he continued to ask and he said, do you love me? I continue asking. He says to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Yeshua's answer to him was, feed my sheep. Interesting. In each case, he says, the indication that you love me is not in your confession, but in your commitment. You say with your mouth that you love me, feed my land. Tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Everything about being a Christian is about paying it forward. Being a Christian does not mean living a basically decent life and when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's a very selfish version of what it means to be connected to Christ. He says, Peter... Given all I've done for you, the least you can do to demonstrate that you really love me. Don't just declare, demonstrate that you love me. I ought to see your mark on the sheep, on the lambs, on someone where you have paid it forward. Fact is, somehow we got this twisted. Most of us learned that loving the Lord meant coming to church most Sundays and then gathering, singing, giving, and listening to the Word. 
However, in Christ's exchange with Peter, everything he asked Peter to do impacted the believers who were coming behind Peter. So are we demonstrating our love for God? The fact is that changed people cannot hide it. When people have been dramatically changed, they tell everyone about the change in their life. Anyone not sharing has likely not been changed by God. Can we look at our, can he look at our hands and see the disposition of our hearts? How can we say we love him and not be fully committed to what is most important to him? These are questions we must answer. And as you answer them, I'm going to ask you to pray with me this prayer. It's up to you. You can stand, you can sit, whatever. I just want to lead you in a prayer of humbling yourself before the Lord. Let's say it together. Father, reorient our hearts so that you are our priority. Help us cultivate a heart for you and the things that matter to you most. Give us hearts of compassion for the lost and deliver us from self-absorbed living. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God, as only you can. We call this cultivating a heart for God, and I do hope the Lord spoke to you through this word. In fact, I'm going to ask you all to stand. I believe that that word was for everybody here. I believe it's for others. I believe it will be for those who, who, who listen on YouTube and by other means. And I, I, you know, there are people we don't even know who will find it and it will but I know in my heart that it was for, for you. I had an unusually hard time today delivering the word. It was as if I was just being pushed back away from this place. My heart was overwhelmed with uh, just a depressive spirit. And I knew what to do. I know how to wage warfare. And you all helped me tear down that stronghold so that that word could I am convinced that that word was from the Lord for the people in this room. And so my prayer for each of you is that that word, that you would take any inclination to harden your heart to it, and you would tear that down in prayer, and you would open yourself so that that word can fall on good ground. It's a heart thing. There is no way to the Father except by the heart cannot get there learning things and taking classes and watching YouTube videos. The Lord has got to find a welcome place in your heart. And if there's, if there's anything that I give to you as your pastor, I hope that you see that God has apprehended my heart and that it inspires you as well to let him catch you. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the mail that you gave us today. Thank you for the invitation to be transformed by the conversion of our hearts. It's a heart thing. And today we are asking you to help us cultivate a heart for God. Have your way, Lord. Create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in us. Do it as only you can. And we will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will be converted to you. We bless you and we honor you. In the name of Yeshua, we thank you keeping us, for sustaining us, 
and for walking with us even as we go. In the name of Yeshua, we do pray. Amen. God bless everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great week. We'll see you next week right here at Kingdom Life. Thank you for tuning in to another life-changing message from Kingdom Life Community. If today's message blessed you, please like, comment, and subscribe. But most importantly, share. Share this message with your family, friends, coworkers, or anyone else you think needs to hear this word. You never know how it will impact them. We pray that you have a blessed week and remember to live the kingdom life. We'll see you soon.